Hello everybody and welcome to Obux Presents. So today we've got Ramdas Batchelda on with us speaking to me and I'm very excited to talk to him. Uh, and we're going to talk mainly about Amma, who's a present day living Indian saint. And uh, um, before we get into that, I just want to introduce Ram. He's, he's uh, born in Pittsburgh. Is that right, Pittsburgh? Yeah, outside of Pittsburgh. Huh? It was yeah. in Penn Hills, yes. Uh -huh. Great, um, Penn Hills, and he was born in 1961. Uh, his spiritual awakening, spiritual journey began properly when he was 21, when in New York he met Amma, uh, who's also known as the Hugging Saint, um, his guru, uh, when he was 25, and then moved to India two years later. Uh, Ram's a songwriter, he's a playwright, uh, he's a children's author, and he's spent the last 27 years in India meeting many saints, uh, meeting many gurus, and also observing many miracles. Uh, he's been happily married since 2002, and him and his wife live on Amma's ashram in Kerala and lead tours to the sacred cities in India. And he's also the author of the book with, uh, with us, O Books, called Rising in Love, uh, which has uh, over 100 five-star reviews on Amazon. It's almost three years uh, old now, and... Um, and continuing to sell and hi Ram welcome good to have you on. hey <laughs> nice to talk to you man <laughs> uh, I know you do lots of different things and um, lots of interests and multi talents but today uh, I like to talk to you about AMA but partly about your book on AMA but firstly to someone maybe who doesn't know much about you know the culture of Indian Saints and uh, who AMA is I just want to ask you quickly for people who might not have heard of her who is Amma? well that's a big question <laughs> and it's something i've been meditating on for almost 30 years uh you know i can start with a quick bio of Amma. you know she was born in 1953 in a poor fishing village uh in on the south uh, west coast of india and that's where her her ashram is now is, is in the place where she was born mm. And um, a wandering saint had told her mother, the Divine Mother is in your womb, when she was pregnant with Amma. And then um, they didn't know what to make of any of that. And, uh, but the young, the young Amma was uh, an amazing child. She had a photographic memory and was uh, immediately in love with God. And as soon as she could speak, she began chanting the names of Krishna. Her parents were devotees of Krishna, and she sort of seemed to know all about Krishna without having read anything about him, and uh, began writing songs to Krishna when she was just five or six years old, and um, would, was obsessed with the names of God, and she would be chanting them all day, and singing all night long, and they thought she was crazy even when she was a child, and... Uh, but she began going into these sort of mystical states of samadhi, and she would fall over, uh, her body would you know, crash to the ground and she would be off in the universe and in, in communion with God and then she would come back uh, and um, they didn't know what to make of her. And uh, they thought she was mentally ill perhaps and she was she was of darker skin than many Indians and so they were prejudiced against her and they sort of made her the family servant, almost like a slave. And uh, her mother became ill when she was in only third grade and she had to pull out of school and attend to all the family chores. And then when those chores were done, she'd have to go over and take care of the, the aunt's house as well. She was mistreated, you know, and they didn't understand her. And she always wanted to meditate and they would, you know, try to beat her to stop it. And she wouldn't, you know, and then she was, she was also full of very intense compassion for, you know, she would go out in search of the grass to feed the cows and she would encounter all of these families in the area that were, you know, suffering for want of food. They didn't have enough money to feed um, feed their own kids. And when she would see this suffering and she realized her parents had a little bit more than they actually needed, she would go and maybe take a piece of jewelry from her mother's uh, dresser and give it to the poor family. And when the, when her parents found out about this, they would beat her again, And, and uh, but she wouldn't stop. She was just full of devotion and compassion and this, uh, you know, began increasing, increasing, accelerating. She would be up all night singing to God, and um, she began to have these visions of Krishna. And uh, 
And eventually she began seeing everything was Krishna, like the tree was a form of Krishna and the little girl, oh, that's a form of Krishna. And she began seeing God everywhere and in everyone. And eventually this culminated in discovering God within herself. She discovered that she was Krishna and Krishna had come to life within her. And um, and then, you know, in, in her late teens, she she really blossomed into this full God, God realization. And one of, you know, she began working miracles although uh, it wasn't her focus, but the, what happened was she was walking through the village um, doing one of her chores to take care of the family, and she heard the priests in, in a local temple reciting um, the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the story of Krishna's childhood. And hearing the words about Krishna, she was transformed into Krishna. She went into kind of a samadhi, a bhava samadhi, and merged in Krishna, and she manifested her oneness with Krishna. And some people there recognized, you know, it's like her skin turned blue. And I've seen Amas blue at, at times when she goes into these states. And it can be even an ordinary darshan program where she's not in a bhava darshan, but uh, she's just giving hugs. And you look and go, my God, she's blue <laughs> like Krishna. I don't know yeah. what that means, but it means something very profound. I mean, it's like the universal energy. She's she's one with that infinite energy and somehow somehow... You know, some people recognized her as, as being like, oh, my God, she's manifesting Krishna. And some people started worshiping her like, oh, Krishna has actually come in the form of this girl. And, and then some skeptics in the group got angry and said, this is not right. Why? Who are you? You have no right to do this. You are not Krishna. You must prove it. If you think you're Krishna, then you have to prove it. And she said, uh, you, must, you must give us a miracle. So they were demanding a miracle. And she said, I have not come to work miracles. I've come, that will only create more desires in your mind. Next week you'll be wanting another one. I've come to destroy your desires, not give you new ones. But they demanded uh, very fiercely, threatening her. And finally she said, all right, you come back in one week and I'll give you a miracle. So this made the word spread. And in the next week, a thousand people had come to witness whatever this is going to be. And um, she asked one of the skeptics, to bring a bucket of water. And so he, he, he brought the bucket and she said, now stir it with your finger. And as he did so, the water turned into milk and some samples of milk were passed out to people. And, and then she said, another skeptic, hey, come, you stir it now. And as he stirred it, it turned into a, a pudding. Panchamritam, it's called. It's five fruits, a uh, very sweet pudding that's used in the worship of Krishna. And they passed out samples of this pudding. Everybody got a spoonful in their palm. Mm. And the bucket remained full to the brim, even after a thousand people had been had been given samples of the pudding. And people said that the, the smell of the pudding stayed on their hands for five days after the event. So there was something absolutely divine about this. It was kind of like a biblical miracle. So her fame began to spread. And at some point, she had a an unexpected vision of the goddess. Um, and in Hinduism, the goddess is not like a secondary deity. It's more like the mother of the entire universe, like Kali, the source of the entire show, Parashakti, the supreme power. So this appeared before her in this gloriously beautiful form, and she was just struck with, with incredible love, and then the goddess disappeared, and she was like struck with this tremendous yearning to see the goddess again. And so she began this, uh, embarked on like three or four months of very intense tapas. In, in the meantime, her family had kicked her out of the house. Her brother thought she was spoiling the reputation of the family, and people thought she was crazy. And, and her father had kicked her out of the house, and she was living on the beach, you know, exposed to the elements. And local animals were coming and, and feeding her, like a cow would come and stand right above her so she could drink directly out of its udders. And um, a dog would bring her food packets. And, and somehow she was able to survive. And she was you know, eating very little, but in constantly repeating the name of the goddess, wanting to see the goddess again. And eventually this culminated in the goddess of the universe appearing before her in a living form, just dazzling like a million suns, and merged in her. So then she merged in the goddess and became one with the goddess. She manifested her union with the goddess. And from there, in this extreme bliss, she was 
pulled into the state of Brahmanyana, which is the absolute. She merged in the absolute, the supreme silence, the supreme peace, the, the supreme reality, which is Brahman, the supreme consciousness. She merged in that. And after she stayed absorbed in this uh, Brahman Samadhi for several days, then she heard a voice telling that this, this bliss has not been given for your enjoyment alone. Go out and serve all beings. See all as your children. All are your own child. You are the mother of the universe. Now go live your life in, in service and compassion for all beings. So then she began uh, giving hugs to the people who would come to see her, and she would listen to their problems and console them and wipe away their tears and give them some words of advice. And she was you know, manifesting this state of God realization. She was permanently established in in the state of oneness with God. There's no no question of falling back. She was she's considered an incarnation of the supreme reality because she had no guru, and this just ex she just exploded into full God realization um, by the power of her own devotion, of her own suffering and her own yearning. She merged in God, but so she's you know she's considered by many people. I'm certainly one of them to be a divine incarnation, a living incarnation of the supreme but um so, so just uh, that's sorry that's amazing there's so much uh, amazing story there um just, yeah. just, to, just to go over and clarify some of it so she was naturally like religiously inclined from a very young age and she said he was a naturally devoted to krishna now so krishna is sort of is major indian deity mythological figure connected to vishnu Am I correct with, with saying that? And he's and you know if you grew up in India, then you'd you know all about Krishna and the stories of Krishna. Yeah. And, and the culture, the culture there is soaked in Krishna, but it's, it's it's very similar in some ways to Jesus Christ. Yeah. That this is one of the great divine incarnations, um, that that came in India maybe five thousand years um, before Christ, or I'm not sure. We don't know. Maybe three thousand years before Christ. But the, the number of legends and stories and scriptures written about Krishna is incredible, and his lifetime was absolutely stunning. Obviously, he was a divine being walking the earth um, to establish spirituality, like all the masters have come to, to serve humanity, to awaken humanity, and, and lay down, uh, you know, give, give us wisdom for how to live and to, to teach us that God is real and that the divinity within us is what we truly are and that the you know the paramatman is what we all truly are immortal changeless cannot suffer cannot die and the goal of life is to realize that and to serve all beings yeah and to help others awaken to that yeah so krishna was one of the great incarnations of god yeah i'm brilliantly put and i'm i'm also interested that yeah you said i mean i think if if she'd be if she, this was happening in the west it would have been, might have been even harder for her in a way but but you said some people you know when she thought she had these mystical experiences very very young people her family treated her badly and maybe thought she was a bit crazy and i imagine if that happened in england or america you know, people would have would have uh you know you know who, who knows what would have happened but 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 culturally in india you talk about the miracles and if this kind of thing happens to you that people people are a bit more open to it people might relate to people differently which kind of half sounds what happened is that right would you say yeah well the indian culture is full of this kind of stories and mm. they, there is there is a natural faith in god that's just kind of like in the soil because there have been in every generation for thousands of years there have been great mahatmas walking all over india mm. and so it's it's part of their culture in a very rich and vibrant way mm. uh, in a way that's not true in america for instance, America is so the TV, you know, it's all about the two minute, uh, the 30 second TV commercial is kind of what American culture has become rooted in, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But um, India has that rich and they have the understanding of reincarnation and the, uh, the evolution of the soul through many lifetimes into the state of God realization. That's a very important understanding that's really to, to a large degree missing in the West. Yeah. But still, nonetheless, you know, when, you know, I'm a. Amma's childhood was so difficult because her family didn't understand. They thought she was crazy, you know. And so, you know, and I also went through some of this during my own spiritual awakening. Um, people thought I was crazy too, and I thought I was crazy for a while because I did not know what was going on. I did not have the understanding. Just like Amma's family didn't have the understanding of what she was going through, I didn't have the understanding of, of what spirituality was. All I knew was that God had 
awakened me and got, you know, I went from atheist to deluded prophet in about a year and a half myself. And then I had, I, you know, all I knew was God was speaking to me and God had well, was awakening me and giving me all this knowledge. But I didn't know what, the, I didn't know anything about the spiritual path. I didn't even know there was a path. I didn't know anybody other than me knew about it. All I knew was God had, boom, you know, hit me with this major <laughs> ray of light. Yeah. So, so that was, you know, that was my story. So maybe that's a good time because uh, to talk about both her hugging and your own spiritual awakening, which you talk about in in the book. Because you say yeah, after she had m sort of real realization, a big state of samadhi, which is like enlightenment or what we call enlightenment or full blown spiritual awakening, um, and she and she began hugging people. And this is in essence one of the main things she does. She travels around the world and hugs people and. Maybe, maybe you could explain how she does that, how that works, and and then maybe a bit about your own spiritual awakening. Because am I right that it was, you know, it was at the same time as meeting her that all this was happening to you? Well, um, yeah. To address the first question, yeah. The, now um, there are large programs, and she comes to the West. She comes to England. She comes to the U.S. and uh, all over Europe. She travels all over the world. And there'll be, you know, maybe maybe two, three thousand people at a program in America or or, or the UK, um, and it's very well organized. And you, everybody gets a token, and you can, you when the, your time comes up, you get in the queue and you move from chair to chair. It's very simple. It's very easy. There's no stress. You know, you're going to stand in a long line or wait for hours, and you know. Um, and then you go up and and you you know you sort of kneel before her, or if you, if kneeling is not comfortable, you can have a chair. Uh, it's all it's all very comfortable and well designed, and then you receive a hug from Alma, and you can ask a question. Uh, there are translators there, and um, and she, she will you know whisper in your ear, and it's a direct transmission of Alma's God realization. You get a little bit of a, a dose of this extreme peace and bliss of the infinite compassion of God that's that's waiting to. You know, waiting to embrace you, and that that uh, so you can you'll receive whatever experience of the divine that you're able to, and, and you know maybe just a little bit more. So you you you're being given this opportunity to commune directly with a living a living saint. But you know, not everybody is ready for the idea of Amma being a divine incarnation or even a saint, and that's perfectly okay. Like nobody's pushing any idea on you of what Amma is. Everybody can go up and have their own experience of Amma and it's, it's just perfectly okay. The bottom line of what Amma is is she's one of the world's greatest humanitarians, right? That's something that anybody can verify. She has this massive charitable organization that's working all over the world and they've built uh, 50,000 houses for the poor and the victims of the tsunami and earthquakes and they have, uh, Amma has 50 schools, K through 12 schools, and an excellent university with links to uh, American universities. And they bring in professors uh, from around the world. And um, she has uh, one of the best hospitals in India. And they're just, they're soon to open a new 2,000 bed hospital. And they give a lot of surgeries and medical care free for the poor. And they do, they're doing like double hand transplants now. I mean, they have excellent equipment and excellent doctors, and they're bringing that quality of care to the poor of India and to any, anyone can go to these hospitals. People come from all over the world to go there. Um, and she's doing tremendous work to uplift women in India. The UN has a special program that they're doing through AMA's organization because AMA's organization has such an excellent reputation as being completely trustworthy and uh, run by volunteers, so there's no overhead. They don't have a huge staff overhead, so you don't lose half of the donation to paying for staff. It's all done by volunteers and people working with so much dedication and love. Because Ama inspires people. Like they, you, you know, you have this contact with Ama, and something in your heart says yes. Like this is not an ordinary person. This is this is divinity itself. Because she's, you know, talking about who Ama is. You know, I love to use the image of the ocean and the waves. That that you know that God is like an, an infinite ocean of divine consciousness and peace and bliss. And this is this is the true self of all beings. And what each one of us is is like a tiny little wave on the surface of that ocean. And what what separates the wave from the ocean? Like, why don't we know? If I'm really a wave on the ocean of God, why don't I know it? Why don't I feel myself filled with peace and bliss all the time? 
it's it's you know if you can see this um, this is a little wave and the line formed by my thumbs is the little is the ego this is this little mental barrier that separates us in our experience from being the ocean the infinite ocean of, of God and uh, ama on the other hand is is a wave like this there's no ego there which means really she's the entirety of the ocean of God coming up amidst the waves, disguised as an ordinary wave, disguised as a person, but actually she's the whole ocean, which means she's present within each one of the waves all the time. And she knows all of our thoughts all the time. She's, she is that you know infinite consciousness and peace and bliss and love that's always within each one of us she's a true self within all beings and so she's coming moving amidst us and hugging us with the with the intention of setting us free from our egos so that we may discover what we truly are so that we may discover that we are that infinite ocean of divine love and bliss so yeah. when we when we receive a hug from her she's helping to you know she does this with a lot of people and she's just she's helping to ease our pain she takes some of our pain onto herself and burns it up and and she's helping us to awaken to our divine nature which is infinite and eternal what we truly are can never suffer and never die and she embodies that so and she knows that and she knows that she also knows each one of us personally and intimately from the inside right so she knows exactly who we are she knows exactly how to help us grow and, you know, you, you, you meet someone like this and it's just an instant blessing. It's an instant, wow, awakening of freshness. And she can, you know, instantly, you know, relieve someone's depression if they've been depressed for two years. Sometimes a depression like that will lift after one hug. So it's, it's amazing the, the power that she has. So I, I've, I've, been, I've been to see Emma in London and it is quite an amazing atmosphere there. It's this incredible, uh, I, I don't want to use the word festival because I don't want to, you know, it's more than a festival, but it's an incredible atmosphere there and full of volunteers, full of people who um, are really passionate about her and deeply yeah. love her. And often, you know, after after they hug, like you said, you know, there's it's very well organized and you have a token and you wait for your turn to come up and people stay. She's kind of on a stage and people, at least when I saw her, people stay around around her presence and around the people hugging afterwards and... Uh, what you're you know what you're describing in terms of what people feel you know it's, it's very palpable um when you're there and, and i know she travels all over the the world to do this so would, would you say it's, it, it really is that power of a hug that 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 is that's created all this incredible popularity and then fueled all the humanitarian work like you say well, I think that's the core of it. You know, it's, 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 it's something so unusual to have such intimate access yeah. to a great Mahatma. You know, I mean, where in the world, you know, you hear about a great guru, but how do you get to meet them even? Maybe, oh, there's an eight-month waiting list to have an interview or whatever. It's like, yeah. you know, very difficult. But Amma, anyone can go and be in her arms and whisper in her ear and, you know, give her a kiss or ask, you know, ask a question. So it's the, the accessibility of Amma yeah. is absolutely it's un, unheard of, really. Yeah. You know, and I think um, that the, the opportunity, I don't think, you know, anyone in history has given so much to so many, right? It's done her utmost to bring the experience of divinity to the masses you know it's really it's really something extraordinary and in india you know sometimes there'll be crowds where there's 40,000 people and she will give hugs to as many people as she can within a 24 hour period and you just sit on stage watching this incredible flow of infinite energy she's she's tireless you know i can't possibly keep up with her mm. um, really she's but she's running she on a different to the battery than the rest you said she doesn't go to the toilet in, you know, 12 hours or something like that. Doing That's right. Yeah. And, and boy, I have to go five times, you know. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, and, and there's these other programs she does, Devi Baba, where she puts on a crown and literally manifests her oneness with the goddess and gives hugs uh, as the goddess all night long. And during those programs, she never takes a bathroom break. She goes 14 hours without a bathroom break. Yeah. So this is not an ordinary human being. This is some, a powerhouse of a human being. So is it... Uh, and her connection with the divine goddess, it's like, is it fair to say, you know, you've got the human being side of her, but then the side of her that's 
and this is I know this is like a concept in India, India like being an avatar but it's like she's appearing as or expressing as the very essence of motherness or you know the motherness of the universe the, the giving and the nurturing and the, she's kind of manifesting that in, in what she does yes I mean she's she's an embodiment to me Ame is an embodiment of all the levels of the divine all the aspects of the divine you know but most of them are hidden and she's you know she's she's a you know walking amidst us wearing white and, and you know almost like an ordinary person and she and she gives her hugs you know not um she comes to our level you know she doesn't want to she's not up there um declaring i am god she's rather you know she comes right to where we are and 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 you know wipes away our tears and she wants us to be comfortable with her and she wants us to feel completely relaxed and she's hugging people from all walks of life including drug addicts murderers prostitutes and you know politicians you know and so whoever it is she's she's there for them wherever they are she can't she doesn't you know try to prove something to people she's not advertising herself as god right she's no she's humble she's your mother she's your friend you know and, and she'll She'll joke with you, and she's so playful, and so relaxed, and so totally enjoyable. But at the same time, it's almost like she's wearing a disguise. She's wearing many layers of disguise, and without that disguise, like we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to come near her. Like if she removed all those veils, she'd be blazing with such a light that we'd all be like, "Oh my God, I can't go near that. That's unbelievable," you know. Mm -hmm. So she puts on all these veils of disguise to enable us to come close to her, and and this way we, you know, she wins our heart. Because we feel so comfortable and so met, you know, but there's always something bigger behind what we're seeing. And we know that, too. There's a sense that there's something there. But she's all the levels and aspects of the divine in a human disguise. Yeah. That's, that's my experience. And it's, that's something that everybody can, you know, come and experience for themselves. And nobody's pushing an idea of what she is. You find out for yourself. And each one has their own relationship with Amma. Yeah, and in the book you talk you talk about uh, this idea of different levels of the divine, and in some of your interactions with her, where you felt known and seen on levels which are beyond, you know, the physical and the normal. Oh, absolutely! I mean, I always feel that with Amma. I know mm -hmm. she's omniscient, and I know when you know she says something to me that really right behind that human disguise is the omniscience of God speaking to me, and there's I never fail to feel that. You know, wow! Actually, that was God speaking to me when she spoke to me. Mm. You know, it's, it, there's no doubt about that. I hear you. And uh, and talking, you know, your book. You talk a lot about your personal experience with her. Are there any times in the book or personal times you talk about that? You know, major lessons or interesting times to share of of you know ups and downs and living, working, yeah. and helping her at all that you, you could share with us now. Well, yeah, you know, there's. When I first came to Amma's ashram, I was absolutely passionately in love with Amma. I was so thrilled to have found a living incarnation of God and be, you know, in, in America, communing with her as if she was right there in the room with me and just feel so thrilled. I, when I finally arrived at her ashram, you know, I had this tremendous ambition. I was going to become super monk. You know, I was going to meditate eight hours a day and I was going to do all the work I could get my hands on and I was going to chant my mantra constantly and remain as humble as a peanut. Yeah. And I had this tremendous idea, you know, and, uh, and you know, arriving in the ashram, it was all so strange and the toilets were really weird and, you know, and everything was different. And um, but there was I'm like radiant, glowing like the sun. And, you know, I could get we could get eight hugs a week in those days. It's on the days that she was doing three Devi Babas a week which meant all night. And on the days when she would give Debbie Baba, she would also give a morning program so you could get two hugs on those days. So I was just like always in her arms and it was just amazing. It was just the heaven realm. <laughs> and my, the first week, you know, I was there. It was like the most incredible bliss and, and joy of my life, you know. And then uh, one morning I woke up and I had a very high fever and it was soon revealed that I had dysentery. And uh, the dysentery continued for days and days, and I got thinner and paler, and the fever was there, and the ashram doctor came and gave me whatever medicine she could, and it wasn't enough. And I was, you know, um, went up to Ama, and there were so many leelas and lessons about this. Uh, but finally, 
I became delirious and Amma said, oh, he's going to have to go to the hospital. So they sent me to this, they took me to, to a hospital about an hour away. And um, so, you know, this was like, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> you know, it was like, it was like, you know, the, the karma from, from all that I had been through in my adult years in the U.S. before my spiritual awakening, and some of it even after my spiritual awakening, it was was being burned off. It was a very intense illness, and um, uh, but there was, you know, it's anguish of feeling abandoned and so much pain, and what have I done wrong? And you know, if I have I displeased you? And and you know, then you know, this ball of light comes out of Amma's photo and sort of washes over me like an ocean wave and fills my whole body with peace and bliss. And I'm, you know, feeling this relief for one night. And then, you know, again, I'm, I'm sick again the next day. And they're giving me intravenous medication. And um, they, they've got, you know, needle. I've had a needle in one hand for like, you know, two days and the hand is really aching. So then I asked the nurse, hey, could you, could you change the needle and put it in, in the left hand? This time, and she tries that, and and uh, and they they couldn't find my veins, and it was all very painful. And I'm like, and then you know, as soon as the nurse nurse leaves the room, I had this thing like, oh wow, the nails in the hands of Christ. I had these you know wounds in my hands, and in the next moment, Jesus appeared in the hospital room, and um, and I felt very clearly that Amma had asked him to come as a part of my healing process and I had a beautiful silent communion with Jesus for maybe 10 seconds and uh, you know there was a sense there was a sense of tremendous compassion complete forgiveness for for what I had been through and also a tremendous sense of humor which I didn't usually associate with Jesus but it was a very healing uh, experience of, of being bathed in this forgiveness and this compassion and this and this sense that he had enjoyed uh, the whole drama of my spiritual awakening, and we didn't really speak about that yet. But um, mm -hmm. you know, part of my part of my initial awakening was uh, it came through through a combination of psychotherapy and um, theater work. I wanted to be an actor when I was young, and I was in a theater conservatory, and I you know I was struggling with tremendous inner obstacles, and I started smoking marijuana. And these three things combined to begin to give me, and at the time I was an atheist, and I was cynical, and I was angry, and really I had a lot of hatred in me, and was very down on myself as well. And and um, and but suddenly I started having these epiphanies of like, oh, higher level, you know, I, I would see the world in a different way for a few days, and uh, then this would kind of fade, and then I would have another one, you know, a week later. And usually marijuana was involved to some extent, <laughs> and um, and then one night. Uh, kind of like the whole wall of darkness kind of collapsed and suddenly God was revealed as the totality uh, and the totality that was conscious that was had, that was speaking to me that had a great sense of humor and that that totality was what my true self really was and uh, so this was the beginning of a very powerful spiritual awakening and when I would smoke weed um, I would literally glow with a light, which I could see in the mirror, and which people who never saw auras before would see. And I had a lot of people, you know, say, "Oh my God, you know, I see something." Or what is that? And people thinking, you know, thinking that I was like some kind of divine being because it was such a powerful energy that so, would radiate and fill an entire room. So uh, was it, when you smoke weed, people would feel something tangibly different around you and. No, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That was uh, that was a that was a big a big thing. I mean, it was a very intense energy, and <laughs> and, um, and uh, I don't, you know, of course, I don't know what that was, other than to say probably it was the Kundalini awakening and you know lighting up the the, the whole nervous system with the light. And I, but I didn't even know what the Kundalini was. I'd never heard of the chakras or anything else. All I knew was this was happening, and it was extremely profound, you know, and very real, and. Uh, so I, I, you know, because I didn't know anything about spirituality, I didn't know about enlightenment or saints, or I didn't even know about the Catholic saints. I was raised kind of like Protestant slash atheist, and uh, we did not, I did not know. I did, you know, and so um, suddenly I'm, I, I met an angel. That was one of my early experiences. And uh, so 
I became deluded. And I thought, well, there's no other explanation that I know of other than I must be the second coming of Christ. <laughs> because I, nobody, you know, that I couldn't think of any other uh, explanation. And I had met an angel. God was speaking to me. And I'm having this amazing light manifestation and energy manifestation. You know, uh, never mind the cigarettes. I'll quit later. But for Christ's sake, obviously, uh, you know, something big is happening here. And nobody in my life knew anything about spirituality. Nobody could advise me. And so this was kind of like the beginning of a two-year uh, comedy of errors in which, uh, you know, I, I thought I was the Messiah and I would do all kinds of crazy stuff. And then, you know, that this was like I'd do six months of that followed by a six-month depression where I, I saw myself the way my parents saw me, which was that I'd gone crazy. And I, oh, my God, I've lost all my friends. I thought I was what? I thought I was who? Mm -hmm. What a joke. What a sad sucker you are, man. You know, at these times I just wanted to kill myself. And then I came back out and did another six months and then another six months down. So it was a very volatile, difficult, dangerous time. And I'm lucky I survived it. Um, so I don't recommend this path. <laughs> but, um, but when I finally discovered that books about the saints of India, um, autobiography of a yogi and the books about Neem Karoli Baba, uh, then I, you know, found the path and I understood very quickly, oh, well, obviously I'm not the Messiah. I'm just a beginner. I don't know where these bizarre light and energy experiences are coming from, but maybe from a past life. But OK, I'm just a beginner on the path now. Start meditating, chant a mantra and, uh, you know, hopefully you'll find your guru and, you know, you're aiming for enlightenment. Now, now I knew where to put my energy. Now I understood, you know, in one week I went I went sane. I, my crazy ideas crashed to the ground and I discovered what the true situation was and, and what the path forward was. Because you started meditating and chanting that grounded you yeah. and got you. Yes. Yeah. And once I started meditating and I didn't study it, I didn't take a class. I just naturally started meditating and it was like, OK, that's the end of this crap. So I stopped smoking <laughs> weed. I didn't need the delusion. I didn't need the drug anymore. I was uh, meditation was enough to bring me into very high emotional uh, bliss state and high energy states and i would have amazing experiences just sitting in a room you know i mean once you know some kind of divine being walked through the wall and entered my body and i was just blazing light and energy and at that point somebody walked into the room and then went running out and running down the stairs i freaked her out you know? um, <laughs> but uh so then you know when i finally then met ama and recognize her as being, oh my God, this is the living incarnation of God. This suddenly made sense of all that I had been through. And the whole comedy of errors now had a, you know, had a context which was a beautiful, a beautiful new understanding of what the whole trajectory was, was now I'm, you know, this is, this is my guru and this is a living divine incarnation. And I'm here to dedicate my life to her service and to realize God through her grace and through her teachings. Yeah. Uh, brilliant and beautiful and how would you say now um so what we're what 27 years on or a bit more than that from around this yeah I met, I met her 30 years ago yeah this was my this last summer was my 30 year anniversary with Ama. Mm -hmm. and how has um i've got to ask you how how what's your journey been like since then i mean it, I've got, so you you've written all about her and what well, i'm part, partly asking you what have you been involved in doing and how have you been serving her and being part of this obviously massive organization with all this incredible humanitarian work and building hospitals and um, yeah. helping disaster in disasters and everything she does. Uh, how, how have you fit in since then and how, how has your own spiritual journey developed since you've been, you know, devoted to her ashram and her, mm -hmm. her work? Well, you know, I've been through many, many stages over the years, and quite a lot of that is written in the book, Rising in Love. Yeah. Um, but the, the core has been daily meditation, mm. you know, usually twice a day. Uh, and my own, my own meditation has developed very richly and, and beautifully so that, you know, I, every day I've been able to, to, to touch peace and bliss. And for me, that's so important to have daily an experience of deep peace and deep bliss. And that's just grown and grown and grown and grown. And I have really a very rich understanding, which I'm looking forward to sharing with the world mm. at the right time. 
Um, but uh, in addition to that, then, you know, there's come all kinds of writing work. And um, for instance, in the old days, you know, I, I recorded two cassettes of songs in the days when we talked about cassettes, um, devotional songs to Rama. And I did a lot of singing for Rama. And then I began to write plays that were performed during Amma's tours, and one of them was done in India also, and we do them in California, we do them on the East Coast in the U.S. These are full-length full length plays with lots of characters and, you know, uh, Shakespeare parodies. Um, you know, it, one of them was written in iambic rhyming pentameter. <laughs> yeah. And uh, tremendous fun. And then I started writing children's books. And I've, I've now done five children's books for Ama, and they get, you know, these are four out of the five are in rhyming verse, and they're beautifully illustrated, and they've been translated into European languages, and they're sold all over the world. And so that's been a really, really beautiful way of serving. You know, trying to bring the essence of spirituality to not just the kids, but their parents also. You know, they're sort of, in a way, they're written for the adults as much as they are for the kids, because they're communicating a very rich concept. Mm -hmm. Um but you disguise it as a children's book, and that that way the adults can also receive it. But I, you know, there's that inspiration in me to bring the highest spiritual knowledge I can to kids as young as possible, so that they can be, they can know, like I did not know when I was a child, how to use my mind, how to direct my energy, what is the goal of life, you know, and and how to attain it, and how to begin working as a, as a, as a young person, how to align myself with with the truth of the divine self and with God and how to, and I didn't know that. And so I got into a whole lot of trouble, you know, and I'm trying to save other people that trouble by helping to give them some of this basic information. And, but in a very enjoyable and delightful way with beautiful art and really fun stories. So that's been, that's been wonderful. And I also did a, a novel in rhyming verse, which is, uh, you know, we printed 5,000 copies and just gave them away to, to the devotees in the ashram and then rising in love which is, you know, my whole life story and so many experiences with Alma. And it's the first one that's really for adults. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's not just for adults, it's for, it's for Westerners, you know. So it's, it's, it's been able to bring new people into to Alma's orbit um, in a way that the ashram books don't tend to do because the ashram books are more safe. Mm -hmm. They are more for formal and all spiritual and, you know, very pure. But for Westerners... You know, people know what it's like to have mental illness and to have a drug addiction and to become deluded and to suffer very intensely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and also they know what it's like to uh, to be sexual and to be very horny and to be desperate for that kind of, to, for sexual fulfillment. So all of that is part of my own story, and that's shared in the book in a way that most ashram books will not touch, you know. Yeah, and I also have to say that your writing style is very funny and very clear, uh, clear and concise, and um, it's kind of entertaining, but also uh, also you know brings to life uh, Amma, the work ashram very clearly and vividly. So it's definitely worth checking out if you're interested in Amma, if you're already into Amma, and if you're not already into Amma but you're interested in learning more about it. Yeah, I had a tremendous amount of fun with that book, and uh, this feels like a, a beautiful success as far as bringing my entire life story, you know, and, and it's funny that um, that part of my life that I went through where I thought I was the Messiah, and I was like a drug addict, and I was you know almost crazy and could easily have committed suicide, that this, um, there, was a, there was a time when I was sort of ashamed of that and wished it hadn't happened, mm -hmm. and when I finally put it on put it into words and put it on paper, there was a tremendous healing and that I saw how how funny it is, how human it is, and how forgivable it all is. And and that uh, being able to serve by sharing that part of my life with people, uh, that's a beautiful thing. Now, not everybody, you know, not everybody can go there because it's pretty intense. It's pretty dark. And, and so it's for people who know what it is to suffer and who don't mind walking through that. What's beautiful is that I went through such a deep hell and came out of it as a very successful, happy man, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, and happily married. I have a beautiful young wife, and she's absolutely adorable. And we've been together 15 years, you know. Mm -hmm. I well, you said you said the books for people who know what it is to suffer, and you said you had to go through hell. I I've spoken to quite a few people uh, on this channel now, and 
I've, I'd say it's quite rare. I, well, I can't think of anyone at the top of my head who, who who's actually ended up serving or being a spiritual teacher who hasn't really suffered at some point. Right. It's often it's often spiritual books. Maybe it's, you know maybe books that are written in India. They're sort of safe. Hmm. You know they don't want to. They're, they're trying to be very uncontroversial and and sort of very holy. You know, hmm. but the. Uh, I've always wanted to tell an honest story and that shares the humanness as being something that's not separate from the divine. Yeah. And that says it's allowed, you're allowed to be human as you grow towards the divine and that all of that rough stuff we go through, including the sexuality and the mental issues that we have, all of that is acceptable. All of that is beautiful and there's nothing to hide. There's no reason to push that away. Bring it all to God. Bring it all to the path. And I think that's uh, that's a really important message because I think it's easy to feel guilty or if you start getting into all this stuff, it's easy to feel guilty if you're not somehow holy or pure or this or that. And and obviously that's ridiculous, right? Yeah, in a way, you know, in a way, spirituality should be something that is designed to remove our guilt and fear and allows us to embrace all of our humanness. Uh, and also, you know, at the same time, open us up to the divine, but never in a judgmental way, mm. uh, in a way that embraces and forgives and heals and leads us to a very whole, holistic awakening that includes everything in the one and doesn't condemn the human uh, at all, and rather embraces and, and uh, enlivens the human. I, I like powers, that. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's lovely, you know, um, humanistic, embrace our humanity and open up to the divine as, as well. I So... Are you, as as, an, uh, someone who lives on the ashram, obviously, look, you know, you, you your creativity has flourished and bloomed. Uh, uh, but are you are you also traveling around the world with them? Are you involved in that day to day stuff, or, or are you based at the ashram? What's what's kind of what's your kind of your day to day life like, or what's what's being part of well, Amma's? Ashram? Yeah, well, you know, my wife and I travel with Amma as much as we can. We don't have a lot of money, so we, we when we have the money and when it, when it feels right, we'll go on a tour with Alma. Uh, she travels a lot in India and she travels all, all over the world. So uh, we go when we can. We you know we like to do the U.S. tour every summer with Alma, and that's a wonderful experience. We love that. And uh, the the tours with within, within India when we can, they're difficult. You're traveling with you know uh, 500 people in buses long 12-hour bus rides and then you mm. get there and you're sleeping in a room with 50 men mm. uh, <laughs> you know and you know you have to deal with the mosquitoes and the, and, the, and the, but it's all worth it I mean sitting up on stage with Ame is the most amazing thing in the world and you get to go up and sit next to her for two minutes and hand her the 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 candy that she gives to the people and you know so this is extraordinarily intimate communion with her and so this yeah, she sort of you know, she carries with her this massive bubble of, of bliss and love and that, that pervades the whole hall, even if there's a hundred thousand people in it, Amma's bubble is 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 encasing everybody who walks in that hall. And so you're just you're carried by that grace. But it's also, you know, there are difficulties. Maybe you get sick and you have to deal with you have a fever and you have a, have a bus ride and you know it's all these things that are they they're purifying but they're challenging. So you take that and you keep that in mind when you whether deciding whether or not you're going to sign up for the next tour, you know. But mm. basically, I follow what I feel Amma tells me to do on the inside. Often, often I'm feeling I'm not going to go on that tour, and then I will hear Amma say, "Come," and that's the end of it. Like, you know, I sign up. You know, I just uh, I do my best to live in obedience to that inner voice because I know she's omniscient and she knows what's truly best for me, and I don't know. You know? And are you helping out on on the stage? Are you on part of the stalls there? Are, are you helping? Cooking? Well, I do. I do uh, stage monitor work, yeah. which is uh, it's it's quite amazing. It's quite challenging. I'm not saying that's the most comfortable thing for me. <laughs> yeah. uh, I prefer to me. I would prefer to just sit and meditate in Anama's presence. That's the most that's my favorite thing to do because that's yeah. absolutely amazing. I'm a meditator. I just love to go to meditate for long periods and. Uh, but as being a stage monitor, you're sort of on edge. You can't. You can. You can. You can try to maintain a kind of a no mind state, but you also have to be up on a moment's notice to help anybody who needs a seat and to help move somebody or seat somebody or help somebody off or if maybe Amma will need something. And so it's a, it's an interesting balance for me of trying to maintain a meditative state with the eyes open, mm -hmm. uh, but be 
responsive to anybody's needs while you know being compassionate and gentle and uh but at the same time sometimes you have to be firm <laughs> so it's an interesting integration for me it brings the meditation into the physical um it's useful it's it's beneficial um i mean i guess it's quite but, a long a long a long shift quite a long stint it's <laughs> You're, well, you're... sometimes, you know, a two hour shift, you know, oh, okay. you know it, there's lots of people doing it. So, you know, it's okay. not like a 10 hour shift. But uh, mm-hmm. well, meanwhile, I'm doing her thing for 12, 14 hours at a shift, you know, yeah, yeah. but uh, it's, it's just it's tremendous. And there's a there's, I have a beautiful meditation space in the main ashram. Mm-hmm. They call it the cave. And uh, so I can sit down there for, for hours each day and. Uh, mm-hmm. And I'm writing, you know, uh, I'm writing a new book right now of uh, stories for teenagers. So uh, hopefully this will be published by the ashram. And if not, then perhaps it could be adapted and, and uh, published by JHP. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it's, it's a lot of fun working on this. It's very challenging. It's, so far, it's like 21 stories, maybe 22 or 23. We'll finish it. So I'm close to it. Within a week or so, I might have a full first draft. Okay, but, fantastic. And... Um... Uh, is the ashram can can anyone just rock up there, or um, how, how does if if someone wanted to get involved, what's what, how how's the best way? Can anyone just come and turn up and see it, or is it... yes, anyone can come. Um, In Kerala, is that right? Kerala, Kerala, yes. sorry, yeah, uh-huh. yeah, um, and they, there's always rooms available. They like it when people can go onto the website. And, and and sort of pre-register and let them know when they're coming. But it's not absolutely necessary by any means. You can go mm. on to www.ama.org mm. and find uh, where to sign up if you're coming to, to the ashram in India. There's a place where you can let them know you're coming, but you don't have to. So you just come to Kerala and, and show up at the ashram and um, they'll, they'll be giving you a, a, a nice room. And there's lots of good food available. It's really quite comfortable compared to the old days. Mm-hmm. And when I first got there, it was challenging. I mean, there was very little variety in the food. A lot of it was very spicy. There was no Western food. And, uh, we, you know, sleeping on grass mats on the floor. And it was very challenging physically. Now it's much, much more comfortable. And there's lots of good Western food available. You know, cappuccino, pizza, <laughs> salads, um, yeah juice you know so it's really a very comfortable place you, to you must have seen it just grow and develop amazingly uh, absolutely years. yeah totally yeah when we first got there oh boy i think there were only two toilets in the whole ashram <laughs> yeah. and um you know the darshan hut was was i held it maybe at a maximum of 100 people and uh, those were amazing days you know i could sit just just 10 feet away from ama and sing for two hours, right to Amma, and she would look over at me and a tear would stream down her cheek or just the sweetness of, or she would make fun of me. Uh, <laughs> you know, as I would mispronounce the words, I was singing in Malayalam, which I don't speak, yeah. and uh, I would often get the words wrong, and as I was kind of a laughing stock in a way, but the, but the, the love between us was palpable, and it still is. It's, it's extraordinary. Lovely, and... Uh, I should just point out very quickly that if you do go and see Emma and get a hug, there's often incredible musicians there, aren't there? And uh, playing bhajans, is that the right term? As they or as the whole thing happens? Could you say that again, Ben? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, when, um, when you do go and see Emma, there's always some br- brilliant musicians there playing, aren't there? Um, I don't know. Is bhajans the right term? Bhajans, yeah. Bhajans, yeah. Bajans, yeah. Huh? yeah. 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 Yeah, the music is a big thing at Amaz Ashram, and it's amazing. It's it's part of what creates that the vibration that, that moves the heart. You know, yeah. so that you get the sense of the holiness of, of what's happening and the incredible devotion that's being expressed. You know, it's so yeah. natural because Amma gives so much to these people that they they they're yearning to give it back. They're yearning to express their heart. And so it's so natural and so real. And the, the vibration in the air is, is, is very strong with, the, with the, the love that's being expressed through the music. And it really helps the heart to open. Just watching, watching the program, watching the people as they're chant, transformed by Amma's love. Mm. That's one of my favorite things. You know, you just sort of sit and watch and feel every heart that opens is your heart. You know, and, you, and, and the tears that come to people, you know, they become your own tears. And it's, it's very moving, very beautiful. 
Beautiful. And uh, and where where can we find you? Have you got a website or um, uh, or uh, how can people get in touch with you if they wanted to get in touch with you? Well, I I created a website for for the JHP book. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a www rising dash in love dot org rising dash in love dot org and you can go into that website and there's a lot about the book there's lots of reviews and there's information about Ame including some videos and um, at the bottom of the first page my email address is there so people can t contact me through that website fantastic Ramdas thank you so much it's I'm almost out of time but it's been such a pleasure speaking to you and your passion, clarity, your knowledge, your open heart is a real pleasure to talk about. And, um, yeah, like I said, if you're, if you're a devotee of AMA or already, and uh, you haven't read the book, you should definitely read it. And if you're interested in finding out more of what AMA is all about, then you should also definitely read it. But yeah, thank you so much. Uh, a great pleasure to talk to you, Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely to talk to you. Yeah.